<laughs> okay, we're recording. Hello, world. Welcome back. <laughs> I've got the lovely Zakia Lucas Murray with us here today. Hello. <laughs> they call her Z. Me like too. some people call me C. <laughs> and yeah, so uh, we've been in the, the industry and the scene kind of meeting each other here and there. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't personally know, and maybe the viewers at home don't know, how you got into this whole industry, how you started with cameras or film in general. So I think that's a great uh, question. It's a very long story, so I'll, I'll try to abbreviate it as much as I can. Uh, I PA'd, I started PAing maybe like a year out of college. Uh, I was a production assistant on lots of famous music videos. That is where I got my start and commercials for a long time. By year four, year five, I was getting really burnt out and I really wanted to pick a department, but I just didn't know how. It was one of those catch-22s every time you want to join a union, it's just like you got to know somebody or you got to go through some trainee program, but all of the trainee programs don't exist anymore. So it's like, so how do you get in? And no one was able to answer that for me. And then I went through a very traumatic experience in my life where I had to leave the business for a little bit. I had a very, uh, my father was sick. And so I had to go back to the real world to get a real job. <laughs> and you know, be home every day at a certain time to look after him. Um, and then we had, when he transitioned and he passed on, I was still stuck at those, I was working two jobs at this point just to make ends meet because the film business, even when you're a PA, PA is decent money, better than the real world. And um, I was really unhappy and I saw my friends thriving in the careers that they went to school for or careers that they've, even different careers that they've chosen, but they have, they're happy in them and I wasn't happy in mine. And I was really talking to my husband now, but my boyfriend at the time, and I was like, I really want to get back into the film business. That's what makes me happy. And he was like, all right, so how do you do that? I don't, I don't know. You know, and I was like, you know, I still know a couple people. I could probably call some people and figure things out and they'll give me a shot. But I was like, I really don't want to go back into PA. I'm too, I'm getting too old now for, for this kind of racket. So here's where it gets into the camera folks. Sorry, that took a long, long route, but here's where we, where we get into the camera. I did some, Google was my friend and I researched how to get into a camera because that was the department that I really enjoyed the most whenever I was on set. Um, and I Googled how to get into the camera department and researched and researched for weeks and re researched again. And then I saw that Made in New York program that, that trains PAs in New York City was having a crafts training program um, for a camera. And I believe it was Grip and Electric at the time. And I was like, is this happening this year? Is this like an old article? I really like just didn't want, I really was almost in disbelief how easily that that came up. And I looked at the dates and I interviewed for it and I looked at all the requirements and the one of the main requirements is that you have to have two years of PA experience, right? Even if you don't have any experience in camera, you didn't have to work at a rental house, which I didn't do. I didn't even know that that was an option. Again, no one told me that this is the route, how you get into camera, even people on set. So, um, I applied, uh, I interviewed, and I and I got in, and it was it was catered to minorities and women, and they took eight students. It was six men, myself, and another young woman, another young lady, and we learned everything, the ins and outs of film and digital, working with cameras over the course of a month, and that was nine years ago, and here I am today. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. It was really, it was really great. They've only done, I was part of the first cycle. They've only done one other cycle since, and that was a year ago, maybe two years ago. They're trying to read the, I talked to the education committee and they're trying to re-implement that program because it's, it's very beneficial if you want to diversify our union. <laughs> yeah, that's no, important. It. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just, it, I mean, find it so fascinating hearing how w we all got into this because we honestly, in the, all the people I've interviewed, all the people I've met on set, it's a different story. Uh, and I had a, a similar experience in the sense of PA for a couple years and starting to reach out to people in departments. But there's always that feeling of like, I'm busy. Like, why are you talking to me? Or I'm doing this job. I don't want you to have my job. So why would I teach you how to do my job? And it was really yeah. kind of tricky to navigate people who were just genuinely like decent. <laughs> I mean, like, well, this is what it's like. Or you just hear, uh, sometimes I, it was like the scarecrow, like they're all pointing in the different directions. Like I, yeah. I did hear about rental houses, but then they were like, but you really should know someone, but you really should know the gear. But it was like, 
So yeah. I don't even know how I really got into it myself, but um, here we are. <laughs> Well, I'm curious, uh, when you, and I guess in part of this interview series is this dialogue between our world pre-COVID and now during slash post-COVID, but I'm curious, in your world pre-COVID, working on sets, did you ever find still like comfort in film and television while you're working on them? Or is that like kind of your work life and then you go home and you like do other things? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I did find comfort at work. I, I always have this thing where it's like, you know how people, when you, and you should know this, because like when we ask each other, how you doing? You're like, you know, living the dream. That's usually like, the, that's like the funny answer, right? But for me, that's a very real answer. Like I am living the dream. I've been wanting to do this, work in this business since I was 16 years old. I had no idea how. I was one of those kids, latchkey kids home, doing my homework and just in that television all day, all night, right? And my parents just, I mean, they just thought, like, you know, the kid just watching TV because it's just an escape. But for me, it was like, how do they do that? But I was always in my mind. I never asked this question out loud because my parents were nurses and immigrants. So they don't know anything about this business. So I'm, I'm obviously not going to ask them. But in my mind, I was always just like, well, how do they do that? Why does, I always give my friends this example. Why does Full House look different aesthetically from Family Matters? I was always, like, <laughs> asking that. See what I mean? That's a and good one anybody who can answer that question for me and I just was like you know who got who you know who's going to answer that question a teacher so I'm going to go to school for this it was, <laughs> it was just and my parents were like you want to go to school for communications I was like yes they were like okay they like they don't know doctor no I want to go to school for this I this is something that you can't teach me you could teach me how to put on a band-aid you know change a, a geriatric person's diaper you could teach me all of that you can't teach me this so I want to go to school for this and um, so, so yeah, back to what you were saying, I do find comfort in being at work because it's like, it's different every day. It's hard work, but it's also different every day. I also give this analogy when a lot of my friends are civilians and they do not work in this business. So I try to, I try to teach them like it's a second language. Yeah. And I'm like, you, have, you ever see like a carnival or a circus come into town and then they're not there anymore? <laughs> That's us every single day. We're come, we come to your town, we barricade, we come in with the trucks, and then we're out like ninjas at the end of the night. And I like that. And it's different every day. But although the parameters of my job are pretty much the same every day, the script is different, the actors are different, the locations are different, the crew is different sometimes. So it's definitely that variety is the spice of life. I get that from my work life. And when my home life is just pretty regular, right? I come home, husband, dog, you know. It's, it's not that there's no variety there, but it's also comfort there too. Where I, I really like, when I walk through my door, I, I talk about this with my husband all the time. It's like, I'm gonna give you 30 minutes of what happened to me at work, but then that's it. Because these people don't live here, they don't pay any bills. And this is where I, I wanna have peace. Because I can't have peace at work all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just really, I think it's really important for people to, to hear that side of us. You know, as, as people that are part of, the world that you're seeing, all this content that's being made. I know specifically during quarantine, so many people have been talking about like what movies they've been watching, what TV shows they've been binging. And I think it's really important to be like, hey, uh, <laughs> we're, you know, all those people that make those shows, we're right. all unemployed you see right all now. The names you skip over when, when, when Netflix says next episode, you skip over all the people that made that happen. <laughs> so many jobs, so many lives, and they're just people that are in your apartment building or the house next door. Right. Uh, yeah. And I just, I, that's, that's cool to me to think about too. Cause I, I feel like I've also had a similar journey of just being excited about like, why don't I know this? How do I know this? How do, where do I find the information? And then it's just like leading to you where you are now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like even, I remember when I first joined the union, um, I didn't know any other women in the union. And so then I went to, one of the first like women's committee meetings. I think that's maybe where I met you and Deb and Meg and so many other people. And I was like, wow, <laughs> they're here. <laughs> I don't see them on set, but like maybe I'm just on different sets. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Actually, maybe that will lead to a good segue uh, <laughs> about some, like maybe what are some jobs that you've worked on that you felt really proud to be a part of or crews that you felt have really supported you in your career? Ooh. You know, <laughs> those could be two different answers, to be yeah. honest with you. 
Um, I'll answer the easier one first. Um, the stuff that I've been the most proud of as a camera assistant, because I can go all the way back to PA stuff, like music videos that I've worked on that have like worked on like 99 problems with like Jay-Z. I've done like uh worked with some of like my idol directors like Hype Williams. Like I know I'm really aging myself at this point, but please Google him. You will not be disappointed. Um Little X, I've worked on Sean Paul videos, E videos, like I've a lot of commercials. Those things I'm really proud of because I worked with good teams and I learned a lot from those individuals and I still talk to them, to most of them to this day. Like they've watched me grow up from literally not knowing the difference between, I don't know, trick line and what a tent is to now being an A camera second and running and basically, you know, being the de facto department. And I, and I use that term loosely because it's, you know, I have to hire people, I have to fill out the time cards, but I do not run the crew. You know, I'm just yeah. like a, I'm just like a general or whatever. Um, so yeah, the projects that I've been proud to work on. SNL, I worked on Saturday Night Live um, skits for the number of years. Um, really, really proud of that. I think I was there for maybe like four seasons. Right. And that was only a job that was only like maybe one or two days a week, but man, like the turnaround time is like, we, they write the script Wednesday, we check out the gear in a rental house Thursday. We shoot Friday, all day Friday. They edit it Saturday. It's on TV Saturday night. Fastest turnaround time I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. And they are a well oiled machine. They've been on the air 45 plus years now at this point. Yeah. Um, I've worked on a lot of stuff that I'm more recently proud of because I've willed that into my universe because I've worked on so many shows that weren't popular or people didn't know about it or it didn't go anywhere. And that's, you know, that's the name of the game. But more recently, I've worked on projects that I'm really proud of, like Pose, season two. I'm really, really proud to tell people that I worked on that show. Um, She's Gotta Have It, season two. I've worked on a number of Spike jobs from PA, from working as a PA to now working as a camera assistant, working on a couple of Spike projects. Yeah, those are the things I'm really, really proud of. And Madam Secretary, because that's like one of my favorite shows, one of my favorite crews. It's really dope. Um, yeah, sometimes the the lines cross where your fav one of your best shows is also your best crew. Sometimes that's not the case. We don't really have to go there, but if you work in this business, you know what I'm talking about. Um, my favorite crews on certain jobs, my favorite crews, crews know who they are because I, much like anybody does in their job, you try to get them rehired, even if it's the day play, just because I want to see my friend. What I think is even more important to say that um, with crews that I like, you know, there are crews that I like, and then there are people have, who have surpassed coworker to friend. Mm. Like, I've talked to them outside of this business, and we check on each other, and that's important to me, too, because that doesn't happen too frequently. Yeah. That's really important, too. I feel like that could be in any industry. It's not just film industry, but I think there's just this other line between maybe you spend, what, eight hours a day in your office with your coworkers, but right. some of us, we spend 18 hours a day. So. Yep when you get to pass that line and how their friends or their family with you, it, it means it. It's like, we've literally been in the trenches. And then there are other times where like, I've spent 18 hours with you. I hope that's the last 18 hours. Yeah, I hope that's my last 18 hours with you literally ever again. Yeah. If I ever hear your name that you're working on a show, I'm completely avoiding it. And I've done that. I've done that as well. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's honest, you know? <laughs> um, are, would you say, are there certain people in your career that you've worked with the longest or if maybe, um, either advised you or mentored you the longest? Um, yeah, there are certain people that I've worked with. You know, that's a, it's, 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 it's definitely, now I really have to think about that question. There are definitely people that I've worked with the longest and we don't work on every single job together, but we try to, or they, or it, even, or at least they try to recommend me, which is the, even the most highest thing. It's like, We've worked together for a long time. It's like, we can't work together now, but they're going to recommend me to somebody else because they have established, we have established this relationship that the person that wants to work with me next is not going to regret hiring me, which mm -hmm. is a very, very high compliment. Uh, when I worked on SNL, I worked with two first assistants that were really mentors for me and hired me when nobody else was hiring me because, you know, and when you first start out in this industry and nobody knows your name, that's it. Nobody wants to know your name. It's very few people that go out on a limb and just like, yeah, come on, I'll give you a shot. And that ended up being um, one person who's in the business, who's no longer in the business, he's now works in the psychology fields. And another person, he's now transitioned from first to DIT. Oh, and okay. again, we still speak outside of this business. It's just like, yo, how's your wife, kids? Like, how, what's it like living where you live in now? And 
those are the highest compliments for me. Right now I'm working, my first on the show that I'm currently on, even though we're on hiatus, is somebody that I've known since literally my first job in the business. And then our paths just kept like, we just kept missing each other. And then he made it a point to like, yo, you not, you busy now? No? All right, I want you on this show. Then I want you on this show. Mm-hmm. Now I want you on this show. So we have now had a long standing, like dedicated career where I'm like, wow, this is also something that I've wanted is, a first that dedicated to this like, yo, we going on every project together. It's a great question. Because you, I trust you and if and whatever I don't trust you with, I'm here to walk you through it, but because I know you're gonna have it. And that's, again, when somebody wants to teach, like you said in the beginning, it's like so many people are just like, oh, I don't know if I wanna show you because you're gonna take my job. No, this person's like, no, I want you to take my job. I'm, I'm, I'm entrusting you with my job. <laughs> so I don't have to do it anymore. I don't wanna do this anymore. Yeah. So it's, it's really, it's really comforting and I, I mean, I, I've, I've watched, I've seen that relationship from a loader standpoint. Um, and I was just like, man, I can't wait to get there to like have this entrusted relationship and like me and this person are gonna work most of the year together and it's gonna be great. That is, it's, a, it's such a great experience too. You know, like it just feels really good when you click with people like that. And that like that shared energy, that shared experience. Cause when you like get in those grooves, like that to me is like, that's what you miss about work when you like, you, you can't wait to like get back and actually see those people. Like I just spent 18 hours with you, but I'm excited to tell you about me right. getting coffee. I don't know. It's just something like, I can't wait to tell you <laughs> that uh, what I saw the subway. I don't know. Like those moments right. are really exciting. And then, yeah. And here we are now, like in our basement. So like, <laughs> what is work? And it's just still like, uh, when we going back to work? Cause I really, I mean, we, you know, we all want to go back to work for the work, but it's also like, but I like the crew that I'm on. So I actually miss these people. <laughs> yeah. I miss those experiences. I like, I like the other departments. It's like not a person on that job that I don't get along with. And it's really like, I miss that part about work. I miss, you know, that camaraderie of like, again, that variety of seeing different people every day and being in the trenches together. <laughs> we're all in this, we're all out here in the rain. We're all out here in the cold. We're all out here in the heated sun. It's, you know, it builds character. It's definitely, uh, now I got a new analogy, like, it's like the military, if you've never been in the military, like, this job, we use military lingo, (laughs) so it's definitely all of those things, the circus, the military circus. (laughs) Military circus, yeah, I think that's actually the best way of putting it. (laughs) You know, it's funny, too, actually, the very first job I worked on, we shot in a circus, and I remember it was just, like, 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 the most, like, redundant, like, like, epic experience, because, like, my first time being on set. And it, and it was like a dog looking at a dog in a mirror. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I'm in the circus, in the circus. <laughs> uh, and I think that even like as PAs, like there was some like scene in a tent and they, I don't remember the, if it was what time period it was supposed to be in, but they like let us, some of us like stand in the back. And I was like, I'm in the tent. <laughs> I was just like immediately sold. Like first experience, like how, how do I stay in the circus? right it's weird it is a very weird thing weird but actually, <laughs> um i've been another thing i've been asking everyone in this series is um that i don't know it used to be this like really odd thing that we didn't really talk about but now quarantine's kind of forced us to do it which is work-life balance mm-hmm. or like maintaining sanity and i'm just curious how it's been for you like in that the life pre-covid when it's so hustle hustle we're freelance next job next job like what are things that you've done that have kept you sane or keep you inspired? To keep working, obviously having a partner that understands the business, even though he doesn't work in the business, is very, is very beneficial for me. Um, he loves hearing about my stories at work. Yeah. He, when we watch TV together, he's always asking me questions. Now he's like, he doesn't even need to ask me the questions anymore. He's just like, but how did they do this? Did they use a jib or a dolly or a steady cam? Like he's like, he you know, he did. Yeah, awesome. so, Having that makes me happy. Like, even if you don't work in this business, the fact that you get excited about it, just like I get excited about it, right, is, is definitely beneficial. So that work-life balance is great. So when, when I'm happy I got a job, he's happy I got a job. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Not just yeah. for the paycheck. It's just more like, yo, I get to hear more about her dope experiences. He loves to talk about my job to his coworkers because my husband works in engineering and they do the same job every day in the same building, the same routine all the time. And, you know, he's like happy to share that 
you know, my wife does a business where it's, it's not normal. It's completely not normal. Yeah. And you're in here watching this TV in the locker room right now. My wife works on that show. Or my wife worked on this commercial. So it's really, it's really nice to have that kind of support at home. And now that I'm on a job that's traveling, which is a big, is a first for me, where it's full-time travel, not just like, oh, I'm just, you know, we going away for a week, like for She's Gotta Have It season two. We went to Puerto Rico for a week and Martha's Vineyard for a week. And it was broken up. It was like one month we went to Puerto Rico at the end of the month. Then another month we went to Martha's mm-hmm. Vineyard at the end of the month. So that was my first taste of working away out of town for my husband. And now this job that I'm on now that's stationed in Virginia, I'm away five days a week. So that work-life balance is different. We are learning. Um, but when I got the job and he was like, and I told him where it was, he was like, all right, so it sounds like you're still taking it. That's fine. And I was like, cool. As long as you think it's fine. So weekends, right? I come up to New York, you come down to Virginia. And that was the end of the conversation. I had the job and we just, we just made it work. And it, not to say that it wasn't hard, but we were looked forward to every Friday evening. Like, all right, I booked my ticket or I'm driving down we're going to spend the next 48 hours together and then I'm going back to work. Then I got to go back. That's important. That's awesome. You really need that support, you know, whether it's your home life or the support on set. Like, I feel like that's more people don't talk about that. Like it's, it's so essential. Right. This is a part of my life that keeps me sane. Not that, you know, you guys aren't great, but you guys don't sleep with me at night. I don't take you home with me. I don't want to take you home with me. Yeah. So, (laughs) So I need to make this part of my life also work. Yeah. Well, what has it been like for you guys during quarantine, if you don't mind sharing? I mean, we're just in each other's faces. No, <laughs> no. My husband is an essential worker, so he's been at work every day since oh, gotcha. quarantine has not stopped him. So, you know, we've been together and it's been, it's been really nice, actually, because for being away for so many months, not even so many months, maybe like two, a month or two at a time, because then the holidays. So it was just nice to be home and see my dog on a regular, too. <laughs> And we haven't driven each other crazy yet. Now I'm trying to get a little antsy about going back to work. But again, we haven't driven each other crazy yet. I found other things to do in, in quarantine. I've been keeping myself busy too. So it's been really nice. That's important. That's great. I mean, I, my, my partner and I, we both work in film. So we both have been at home. So that's like a whole other game of like, <laughs> how are we not going to kill each other today? Exactly. A creative outlet like what you have right now is great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's doing his thing. I'm doing my thing over here. <laughs> I swear if there was a dog, it'd be somewhere in the middle, but we, there's not enough space for a dog. My dog spends more time with him. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm alone in my little world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Literally my own, this is my quote unquote office space. Oh yeah. No, it's great. Thanks. Food is always. I love the food is there. It's actually, food. it's like I turned my a room in my house into like my yoga zen den. Oh, so, that's Yeah, so that's why Buddha's here. He's like, he's supposed to be on the wall, but he's good right here. And it also makes for a nice backdrop. Yeah. <laughs> and my biggest thing is I've got all my plants. I'm not going to move the camera on, but I've got like a, a lot of plants that are hanging above oh, me. So they're, I'm looking they're, at two plant, like three plants directly in front of me, like oh, over the horizon, okay. the computer screen. Yeah, I think <laughs> if anything, I... I have built this like new, maybe a bit weird relationship with my plants because I'm home around them a lot. Like it's one thing when you work like 60 to 75 hours a week and you're like, oh, it's nice to see plants. Yeah. Like, <laughs> for like a minute of your day before you go to sleep. The Greens Committee is all fake plants. <laughs> yeah. And you can't keep plants on the truck. It doesn't, it doesn't I, work. You know, I've tried. And let me tell you, there are some ways to get around it. <laughs> Oh, we'll, we'll talk off the camera then about okay. that. I definitely want to keep plants on the truck now. Now that i am become a, a clarence, is that what they call it? Pl- Ooh, like maybe. <laughs> uh, well, whatever that is, I'm it. But it's, I have to say, I've built what I mean like an odd relationship. It's like I see them all all the time now. So I feel like they're like trying to tell me something. Like, they why don't you water me? And I'm like, girl, like I only water you once a week. Just because I'm home every day doesn't mean you get more. Like, I feel like they're like, <laughs> do you me sometimes? And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> to them. I'm like, I need to be back on set so I'm not talking to my plants so much <laughs> but anyway speaking of back on set um would you say there are certain cinematographers or certain movies that you can like always go to and be like I love their work this movie always makes me happy 
or I'm always like so moved by this. Do you have those? From a cinematographer standpoint or just a movie standpoint? I mean both. I guess those are kind of two questions, but. Um, cool, that's a hard question. Definitely I have more movies in mind than more the cinema. I'm trying to pay, I'm uh, trying to say this. Uh, there are definitely movies that I go to just to watch for their visuals, absolutely. But the more of my time now, because obviously we're all trying to just keep a stable head, is just to find things that make me laugh and not, or learn about, right? So I've been in my Netflix, like watching documentaries like Disclosure, things like that. Um, I watched the di- documentary about Marsha P. Johnson. I want to watch mm-hmm. I Am Not Your Negro. Like I want, I'm in a, I'm in a, I want to use Netflix to learn. And then sometimes I want to use Netflix to laugh. So it depends on how I'm feeling. Yeah. Um, every day that I wake up, I'm always watching like, maybe not nostalgic movies, but definitely movies that I'm just like, I've seen a hundred times or shows that I've watched a thousand times. And I'm just like, I'm just going to watch this again. And I'm going to fold clothes while it's on because I, I know this thing visually and audibly by heart. So I really don't have to do anything. But sometimes I'm also just like, I'm just going to lay in bed and just go again. And again and again. So uh, my go-to ones, though, uh, I've been watching The Fifth Element a lot. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> That's been on TV a lot. Um, yeah, because, and I'm just like, it's not a great movie, but it's a classic for some reason. <laughs> it's, not, it's not horrible, but it's like, it could have been better. But it's, it's got too many, too many lines, too many, you know, the whole Lilu, the Corbin, da- uh, everything. Um, what else have I been watching? I, I finally watched uh, Ar- The Rest of Orange is the New Black. Never finished the last season. Finally finished that. I, I'm big on, like, watching shows that I I started and that I need to finish, right? I like to, I like to, you know, even if the show fell off, I'm still like, I, but I gotta watch it to the end, though, because I just gotta see how it ends. <laughs> it is funny to, like, go back and you're like, I didn't watch the last five episodes of the show. Yeah, exactly. I'm just like, oh, I got to do, I got to do better. And I'm home now, so I have no excuse. Exactly. Um, uh, what else? I'm a new fan of a show. It's called show I May Destroy You. I'm a fan of their cinematography. Oh. It's a British show on HBO. Someone the just story, recommended that to me. I've got to check it out. It's so good, but it's very traumatic. Um, I, have, I have to preface that. Like, this, this time is a lot of uh, programming that is like tipping the scales of, we're going to tell this story no matter what. You know what I'm saying? Here's a helpful resource contact number and website afterwards but this story this story needs to be told um, and i may destroy you is one of those shows okay. also the shy love that show the shy the shy so it's about chicago um oh, okay. by this lena waits produced show oh okay okay really really good also this season very traumatic if you so i suggest if you've never seen it watch it from season one get to know the characters by the time you get to season three, you'll be very invested. But this season deals with uh, child trafficking and kidnapping in the black community. Oof. Yeah. So I'm more like, not only do I need to be visually stunned at this point, I need to be like, the story needs to be great mm-hmm. to keep me. And it has to be real. Like, I, like, again, I love cartoons and I love to laugh, but there's certain things that I'm like, I need to learn about things, these things because... Whew, man, like the top of the subject at hand, I, of those two shows of I May Destroy You and The Shy, I've never had to, I've never uh, been abused or had anything, ha- had to fear for my life in that kind of way. And I'm like, I really want to hear what this person's pers- perspective is on that. And I don't want it whitewashed. And I don't want it, I don't want it content washed. Not even just whitewashed. I don't want it content washed. I don't want this, this, this scary kidnapping or this rape scene to be sugarcoated. It's ugly, and people need to see that it's ugly. And I'm one of those people that I'm just like, well, make it ugly, because I'm because I'm I'm tuned in. That's a really good point. And you know, actually, my my partner was was trying to get me into the new Netflix show. It's like a doc series called Immigration Nation, uh, and it, and it had the that same feeling. Like you know, one episode in, I was like, this is <laughs> this is a little difficult, <laughs> but it's like important, right. you know. And that's right. it's tough. Is like like. I, I feel like there's just so many versions of it now that it's just like, why not mm-hmm. keep going? You know, like Another, it's one thing, you know, when uh, you like, you uh, like school. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. What were you saying? Oh, I just was saying that like, 
at least in my history, like there's certain things that so you were like taught in school and then it's like, okay, I was educated this, this, and this, and then it sort of like ends. And then you're just like an adult and you're experiencing things. So for me, it's like when I watch certain movies and especially now documentaries, like, like why not take this chance during quarantine to really like immerse myself in it? Like say like, this is difficult and challenging, but this is the time to do it. <laughs> Right, because we are living in difficult and challenging times, son. This quarantine and, and, and the Black Lives Matter protest, all these protests against the police, this, this is scary times. This is no sci-fi movie prepared us for any of this. Not a pandemic and a civil, and a civil rights part two at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> like you, can't, you can't make this stuff up. Yeah. Um, but then there's amazing stuff out there still, and there's people that are really using their platform or... Like I found re recently because I was, what I was telling you before, I've been like watching so much Pose and then I was like, well, I need to like keep going. And so I've been like following some of the main actors on Instagram. And it's just so amazing to see like when these people are a part of a show that's, you know, we think of this, this, this whole machine that we're a part of is kind of separate from us. Like, oh, this is right. like this beautiful stuff that makes you happy or makes you sad. But when you see those people take that platform and then use it for politics, to use it for programs, or it's just like, that's exciting. It's like exciting to see those people like engage in the world. And it's, it, and I really didn't think about it until really just now because of what the time that we're in currently. That show, every, every actor on there is an activist in their own right. And that was very powerful that I didn't recognize. I mean, I recognized it then, but I didn't have the vocabulary to put it into words mm -hmm. until literally this moment. Every single first teamer on that show was an activist in their own right. And it just, it's very powerful to be around. It's very fun. I mean, filming those ballroom scenes, let me tell you, the high point of my career at this point, okay? It's, it's very hard to beat those because it was entertaining all the time. It was hard work, let me tell you. But the laughter, the joy, this just the community of the extras that I was around, mm. it's like, you can't beat that. Down to the extras. I mean, the first teamers were absolutely great, but the extras, we saw them all the time, too. They were a part of the show. Yeah. They were a key part of the show. And it was, again, I, like, I cannot speak enough about that show. It was like a high, one of the high points of my career. It really is. And you know, actually, it, that brings me to when I was in college uh that was the first time i was introduced to the documentary uh, paris is burning about ballroom culture i mean obviously and <laughs> it was just like i've only then recently through watching disclosure through watching pose started to acknowledge that you know it's one thing to to make certain content but then to not actually engage with communities or to be able to lift communities up through that work that's mm -hmm. just like it's i don't know it just that again like just hit me tell you talking to you like it's so awesome when you get to be a part of that as even like the behind the scenes team, but yeah. that's also like the, I don't know, part of like the essential work or the part of like what we can do to really make this live like louder and like larger, mm -hmm. how it actually affects oh, yeah. the community. And, and we're just talking about like the extras and just talking about all these other people, like they're all a part of it. The writers, the producers, like, like hiring more diverse people in your fucking crews, like. Yeah, yes. Oh man, a whole nother topic. <laughs> I, know. I mean, I could obviously keep talking to you forever about this stuff, but I'm not sure how much. I mean, I feel like people at home should be interested in this, but if people didn't know, <laughs> sometimes your favorite movies. <laughs> oh, I don't want to like spoil it, but sometimes your favorite movies <laughs> behind the scenes have a very different cast than is in front of the camera. Absolutely. And it's pretty remarkable when it actually meets and the whole crew around you is looks and feels and is represented by the story you're trying to tell. But that's like a mm -hmm. whole new wave of what we're hoping to get in the yeah. future. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. The, uh, <laughs> the, the lack of diversity at this point is still rampant. It's 2020, right? We're going into 2021 and it is still the numbers. There are no numbers as we've been through various meetings there are no numbers for diversity. You know, we just know the, the union is majority white male, and then a fifth is about white female, and there are no numbers for anybody else who don't identify as one of those two things. I just, we, we put people in space, and somehow we can't figure out basic data management of representation. 
it's, it's like take a census of your union members right isn't, isn't that how the census works like you figure yeah. out who's in there and you know you figure out who identifies as what and it's just it's just a weird space to be in but um one of my main things when i joined maybe not immediately when i joined i know when i joined the union i was told by the few black and brown men who are in the union were like girl you, it's hard for us it's gonna be hard it's gonna be hard for you too but we're here for you and i and i just needed to to hear that and they have been here there for me to be honest with you i still again am in contact with them and or i've worked with them recently and um yeah my experience has been a long road but i'm here to make it easier for somebody else if that's the brunt of my job in 2011 when i joined this union people were telling me like oh you might be the only one in the tri-state area at all i'm just like really the problem is there's no access right you're not making this job interesting to people like me because i went to school with other girls and and boys and black and brown boys who wanted to be in this industry but gave up because they didn't see any representation or they didn't know how they just didn't keep on with the fight and my goal was to keep on going after college like i said i pa'd i interned i did all the things so i was like i want to make it here i don't see anybody i don't hear those names you know i i know what a producer is but like the other names that don't get pictured is like who are these who are these people and um so yeah like i uh <laughs> i have been the diversity hire and <laughs> um it is it's a it's a good feeling because it's like okay somebody wants to spice sorry for lack of a better word but wants to change things and within the union and then there's other people that just like oh she's not doing a great job but i can't let her go because she's a diversity hire I've, I've also had that that attitude as well so it is a rough place to be in but like i said i am here to change the game in any way i can i'm here to inspire the new generation of uh pas and you know, I always get complimented on set that like, wow, I've never seen somebody like you on set. I mean, that could I could take that a lot of ways. I'm I'm black. I'm a woman. I'm six two. Like you, you probably never seen. You probably literally have never seen anybody that looks like me on set. But um, I I take that as a compliment. I take that with pride because I'm like, well, the fact that you see me means that everybody else sees me, but they just not saying anything about it. And I'm and I'm here to stay. So just get used to it. I've spoken at um, panels for the Maine in New York program because those are all minority-based programs. And these kids are literally just out of school, just like, man, I, don't, I, I, I just wanted to thought about being a PA, but now I'm thinking about being a camera. I'm thinking about being in props. And I'm like, these are important questions to ask that nobody gets to ask PAs because you're just like, you, you know, you want to be in the film. It's all right, cool, you here. Can you tell me where Crafty is or where the bathrooms are? But I asked them, like, I, went, I made it a point to ask each one, like, okay, you're a PA, but what, what are you thinking about doing? What department are you thinking about being in? Because that's what you need to be thinking about. This PA is just a, is literally a very small step ladder to the rest of your career. If you want to be an AD, that's fine. But I knew I didn't want to be an AD. <laughs> I've been on many a job and I saw what it takes to be an AD. I have it. I don't want it. I, I, I don't want that to be my main skill. So I, I, I coach people to like reach out to me and like just you know, I hope that we cross paths. And if you ever have a question, don't be afraid to pull me to the side. Just ask me or ask me in front of people. I, I pull no punches. <laughs> I'm very brutally honest about this business. But I'm also brutally honest about my experience. And it's not great, but I'm still here. I'm never going to give up on this business. Not until I, I don't know, not, not until I get an operator and I get an award from the SOC. You know, I'm never said that out loud, but here it is. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's important though. People need to hear that, you yeah. know, like even we mentioned this like off, off camera before we were recording, but like as a white woman under six foot, I felt exotic sometimes on set and I'm just like this small white girl, you know, and <laughs> it's like really remarkable to, you know, even in like the less than four years I've been working in cameras. I mean, I've been peeing actually since 2011 as well, but you know, seeing how much it's changed and seeing how much more comfortable people are getting or more language they're learning around just talking about it or engaging with people. But I mean, it's also just like basic human skills of being able to say hi, introduce yourself, talk right. a little bit about something of depth. Yeah. Uh, but it is important, I think, for more people to hear your voice and to use our platform in any ways we have to keep amplifying voices. So 
Absolutely. I mean, you've been inspiring to me before and after this. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> well, normally we, at the end, I was like, we, at the end of the series, I've been asking people um, kind of what they feel the world or our sets will look like <laughs> post-COVID, but clearly we're in a what are we doing now during COVID moment? So <laughs> if either you have any thoughts on that or even just like words of advice. Uh, about what are we doing now prior to it? Washing my hands, minding my business. <laughs> um, <laughs> literally. And that's the attitude I continue to take to set, like continue to wash my hands because we are in an environment where we're always sharing tools, we're sharing each other's spaces. It's going to be really difficult. It's going to look very different. I've gotten so many offers at this point now in August uh, about uh, opportunities to work and it's like above me so we're, all right so we're, currently right now I'm a second AC that's what I'm I am comfortable working in I've been getting uh, offers for first thing and I'm just like I'm not there yet I appreciate the offer but I'm gonna be honest with you I'm not there yet please keep my number if you know of anything else but it seems like they're going straight from first eliminating the second AC and hiring a, a loader or a media manager to do the second AC work and it's just like you can't skip over can't skip over that you, you, now you got one person doing practically triple the work. You know, where the I've first gotten, is only focusing on, put, literally focusing on focus. I've gotten the same calls, actually. It's really interesting of like people that, it's like they're saying it's a union job or who knows if it's non-union or union, but then they're like right. eliminating positions. And I think it's, it's really right. important to, to be able to say to someone like, I don't feel comfortable doing this. And that's right. hard because we both, I don't know, I could say it for myself, but I know a lot of people grew up in like, I just have to say yes to things. Like it's an opportunity yeah. to say yes to it, but this is a different ball game. The worst, the worst idea is to say yes to something of a job that you don't know how to do, right? And, I, and I, I have the knowledge of what it takes to pull focus. Can I do it great? Nope, and I'm completely honest about that. And if that costs me a job, it costs me a job. But what I'm not gonna do is ruin my reputation by calling myself a first and I'm terrible at the job. Then I'm never gonna work again, period. Because there's a way to learn these things, but like, there's always that like balance between like getting those opportunities to, to actually hone the skill versus going. Right. Give me some more, to, give me like another year to like hone in on the skill, you know, a couple more times to practice on the job. But if it's not talking heads, I can't help you. Like if you can't guarantee me that this whole thing is a talking head, I could do that. Can I do somebody walking across this plane and this? No, no, <laughs> absolutely not. I'm not there yet and I'm completely honest with that. But um. Uh, it's going to look very different. Uh, I have masks and gloves prepared that are all have cute sayings or something on it to keep me entertained while I'm on set. <laughs> That's great. Um, I am, I, I really look forward to getting back to work and in, in the most safe conditions possible, obviously. Um, it's going to be hard, right? Because we don't know a world of doing this job apart, like remotely. Like, I understand, like, people who work concerts, that might be their thing, but, like, with, te with television and movies, it's very hard to not be next to my first assistant watching his shot, right? Because that's how I'm going to learn. So now you're telling me I got to stand six feet behind this dude, so now I can't learn his job, <laughs> right? Um, or sharing tools. It's like, you know, you're in a pinch. We got to get this shot done. Let me borrow your Leatherman. It's like, now I got to be like, oh, I'm not supposed to. It's like, bro, take my Leatherman. Just, I'm going to sanitize it when I'm done. Like, we just need to come up with those things to um, not eliminate jobs, but it's actually going to increase jobs because I feel like for us, like, the set medic can't be just one person now. It literally needs to be, like, a team of at least three to five people. Yeah. Just my opinion, right? You need a whole staff now. If you're going to be testing people and you're going to be, like, like, it just can't be one person for an, a crew of 100. That's, that's impossible. Even with a Band-Aid. That's, that's almost impossible. You really hurt yourself on set. Now it's like this one person only has time for you or, or, or so-and-so. And so the, I feel like the set, the medic team, whatever, however they're going to do this in the future needs to be expanded and truly like trained in the, this new world order that we're going to live in. But yeah, I, you know, the, it's going to be hard. I feel like just people, if people wear masks, like we've all been doing in the supermarket it's going to be hard to be six feet away from every single person, but if we're going to be in close proximity, we need to practice safer precautions. And with the camera department, it's pretty necessary for us to be practically on top of each other. Yeah. Unless the operator is going to hold his own camera all the time. You know, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, I have to be there to receive it 
and be ready to put it on his shoulder. I'm going to be mask protected and gloved at all times. But to stand six feet away from me, what am I going to do? Throw the camera? <laughs> just like, here, just catch it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely going to be a bit bizarre, especially when, you know, between the, ver the different versions of the white papers and, and reality. Right. But clearly some people are trying. We'll just see how it goes. And yeah. I, I I have not been um, able to, to work yet. I haven't found the right job that has been offered to me for me to, to work in and give firsthand experience about what it's like. So I, I don't know, but I'm ready, willing, and able, again, to get back to work and under the safest precautions that there can be, within reason, also within reason, right? Because also with all the new white papers about, you know, sanitizing gear every couple of hours, it's like, does the DGA know that? Have you to the DJ about that? They make the schedule. Yeah. So does this mean that our work day, we're going to do less script pages? Does that mean that our now our work, our job, our six-month job is now going to turn to a 10-month job because we're doing less pages? All of these things need to be taken into account. The camera's going to be clean. We have a whole entire team. We have a staff of 10 to make sure uh, that that happens, right? But who's going to help us stay on schedule with all the things that we have to do with all these new safety guidelines? Yeah. That's, that's, the, <laughs> that's the key of it. Yeah. yeah. We shall see. Yeah. But I'm telling you, finding a hobby during this time is, or, or a new certification is very helpful. <laughs> this is, this has been my hobby. So. I, I worked on my, I got certified to teach yoga in, during quarantine. So I'm ready to go back to work and implement that into work. Awesome. Anybody want to meditate during lunch? I got you. If you don't, I'll be meditating by myself. I, I had a model loader take a, I, I didn't have her, but she took a picture of me meditating during lunch, sitting on a lens case. <laughs> so, it was like the, I was like, this is literally my two worlds colliding at this point. And it is a, I like the picture really. I'm about to use it as my profile. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I want to thank you again so much for your time. I know we could keep talking, but I like to try to. We literally can. <laughs> thanks so much i really appreciate it you're so welcome this is so fun thank you for inviting me of course hope Talk everyone later. enjoyed <laughs>